You're going to miss some class, sure. Okay, has everybody seen Chemistry yes, Chapter 6? Yes, sir. All right. Um, I'm also going to be talking through this, too, if you maybe, but you'll hear me anyways. You don't have to. You're being recorded, everything you say right now, so just so you know. Thank you. That's, that should be what we're used to in the next <laughs> few minutes. All right, so we're going to talk about organizing the elements, and there's a history behind it. So we're going to learn a little bit of history today. Eric? Okay, so I'm sure all of you have played maybe Uno, like this game set here. <laughs> Crazy Eights, okay. Crazy Eights is, is another game that's very similar to this. When you look at any deck of cards, you will see different colors and different um, suits, for instance, okay? And a lot of times you'll put the same things together depending on the card game that you're playing. Quick reminder, if you did not play the Friday Firebird, teacher, teachers, it is in your email. Thank you. Okay. Next, we, just like we organize our cards when we're playing a game, we actually organize the elements. So you can think of this as classification. This is something that we do normally as human beings. In biology, you classify the animals and plants, okay, into phylum and things like that. Okay, now, as I said, we're going to talk a little bit about history and talk a little bit about how chemists started organizing the elements. It all started in around 1700 when there was only about 13 elements. Okay, some chemists thought, well, there must be other elements than these ones that we know. But right now, this was the beginning of chemistry. We haven't really started doing a lot of experimentations. There were people like the alchemists who were making things, but we really didn't start organizing the elements. All right. Okay. Um, but towards the end of the 16th, I mean, sorry, this 18th century, the chemists started dis discovering other elements. So it was time to organize them. So in the early 1800s, there was a German chemist. Now, Germany was very, very famous for its chemistry. It was probably the birthplace of a lot of modern chemistry. And a gentleman named Dobriner, okay, came up with a classification system based on three elements that had similar properties, okay? And he called these groups of elements triads because that meant three. So right here in this picture here, we have, let me just do this, yeah. there we go, okay, right here we have three elements that were in the same triad. This is chlorine, this is bromine, and this is iodine. Now, I'm going to do this because they are ne these are elements we're going to learn that are never alone. Okay, so chlorine in this picture looks a little bit like a yellow, but if you saw this in real life, I think you'd see it as green. I think this is a poorly made photograph. Okay, the bromine is reddish brown and iodine is purple, which is kind of pretty. All right, so he came up and classified things that had very similar properties. So this is the first thing. We're going to organize our elements because they have similar properties, and we're going to somehow put them together. So this is the first organizing principle that we still use today. <coughs> okay, now, Dobriner noticed a pattern in his triads, and what he was able to do is, say he took um, chlorine and iodine and looked at their masses. Chlorine has a mass of about 35, iodine has a mass of about 127. If he added those together and found their average, he came up with about 81. Bromine's mass is 79.9, very close to 81. 
So he was able to predict that there was some sort of repetition occurring based on these masses. So this is going to be a very, very critical thing, is that he was able to see that we could look at these repeating properties having to do with masses. Okay, so atomic mass was a big part of an observation also made. So we've got similar properties and something about masses. So if you have three things in a group, the middle element should be about halfway in between the masses of the other two. Okay, so these are things that will be important. Okay, why do you think, this is a question, why do you think it was important for scientists to find a logical way to organize the elements? Make it easier for them to find the elements. Find things, find things that were maybe similar in nat nature. Okay. <laughs> find trends, maybe. Let's see what let's see what it is. All right. So basically to come up with an organization. All right, you guys mentioned that. All right. So I would say finding trends, finding ways of organizing the elements so that we understand that. All right, now here's the big guy. Mendeleev, okay? Mendeleev was a Russian scientist. There he is. He's, I like Mendeleev because he has a beard. I wish I could have a beard like Mendeleev. All right? But he was around the end of the 1800s, 1869. And remember how we talked about cards in the first slide today? Oh, yeah, Uno. Uno. We, had, we looked at Uno, okay? Crazy eights. So what we have then is in those cards, we actually have a chance to have a blank card. And we took a blank card. Dimitri there took a blank card and wrote down what was known about the elements that he knew. He wrote down their mass. He wrote down their color. He wrote down their melting point, their boiling point if he knew it. He, he wrote down if they were solid, liquid, or gas at room temperature. He wrote about some of the chemical reactions that occurred with them. And he put this all on paper. He didn't do any experimentation himself. He was not an experimental chemist. Okay? So he wrote no experiments. So just like if you're playing a card game, he shuffled his deck and started playing like solitaire. But instead of playing solitaire, he put all of the elements that had similar properties together in groups. All right? Okay? And so he was able to move these cards around until he found an organization that worked. Now, if we looked at this, he basically um, organized his group on a set of repeating properties. Just like Dobriner noticed, there were similar properties. So this is a theme that's coming through the periodic table. The periodic table is organized by repeating similar properties. Okay, so that is really important. And the idea of groups. These are going to be important terms. We'll, re we'll revisit it. You may be wanting to take some notes now on paper because you can't take it on your computer right now. You may want to take some notes so you don't forget. Okay. You can, but then you might, I'm saying a lot more than what's on the video. Okay, so if you look at the bottom of this page, you would once again see the word atomic mass. So if you go through his periodic table, you will see that the atomic mass of each succeeding element is increasing more than the one before it. So he used mass as his method. So we have repeating properties and atomic mass is Mendeleev's table, okay? Now we're going to find out he's not quite right, but we'll, we'll get to that. All right, here's Mendeleev's ta table. It's a little bit weird from what we see today, and it's not because it's in Russian. Okay, so he's got his first element, hydrogen, and then he's got a second element, lithium, and they're in the same row. But if we look, go down to lithium, let's look at something. If I draw a box from here to here,
Okay, that row looks awful, an awful lot like the first column in the modern periodic table. So what he did, he took things with similar properties and put them in the same row. We put things with similar properties in the same column. All right, so if we look up here, there's fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So that's similar to the triad that Dobriner had, except fluorine isn't in there. Anybody want to give a guess why he might have not seen fluorine? I mean, for Dobriner, that could be true. That could be true. Also, fluorine is a gas. Chlorine is a gas too, but you can isolate it and it's colored. Fluorine is not, doesn't really have a color. So you probably couldn't see it besides. So that's probably why it wasn't there. Then if we go up here, we see the oxygen group and so on and so forth. Now, what's weird is he ends his groups with what we would call our first group, okay? So his groups are horizontal, our groups are vertical, his groups are in increasing mass order. So 1, 7, 9, 11, 12, 14, 16, 19, 23, 24, 27. Okay, look at this right here. Thank you. That, I was hoping someone would ask me that. Very good. You're absolutely right, Eric. Okay, he wasn't sure or there was no element that fit there. So what did he do? He put, he saved that space and said, this is for some element that's halfway between my known elements. Okay, so he put things with question marks because he wasn't sure what goes there. Okay, but he made predictions about their physical properties, their chemical properties, and when these elements were discovered, he got their mass exactly right, and he got their properties exactly right. So the periodic table allowed him to predict the existence of new elements, all right? Okay, so notice the two question marks between zinc and arsenic, okay? So find zinc. Okay, so if we go up here, Z N. Oh, I see it. I see it. It says sixty-five. So the these are the elements he was. He said, "Gee, something that has a mass of sixty-eight or so, and something that has a mass of seventy, should go there." Okay. And he left them blank because he knew that bromine belonged with chlorine and iodine. So basically. He's saying, hey, there's something that goes there. And he predicted that some elements would have the properties, as I mentioned, would be shown in those spaces. So these elements that he left out were present-day elements gallium and germanium, okay, which were discovered maybe about um, 6 to 15 years later. And as I said, there was a match between his predicted properties and the actual properties of these elements. This fact is what convinced other scientists that this was a very powerful tool and they started adopting Mendeleev's periodic table. Okay, So the fact that he was able to predict new elements and organize elements that were similar was a huge, huge change. Huge. It's huge. Like the wall. <laughs> huge. huge. It's going to be so huge. Okay, why was Mendeleev's periodic table an improvement over Dobriner's triad classification system and other earlier systems? What do you think? Okay, and what else could it do? What was the key word I said? It can be used to determine, determine, determine identify, uh, predict. predict, thank you. Wow. Okay. Mendeleev's periodic table could encompass all known elements 
and accurately predicted the existence and properties of undiscovered elements. Okay? So that's what is so important. It can be organized things by properties and predicted the existence. So what it did is uh, Dobriner didn't use all the elements. Mendeleev used all the elements that were known and some that weren't even discovered yet. So let's go to the modern periodic table. Okay, the modern periodic table is very similar to um, Mendeleev's, but it's not organized by atomic mass. Why do you think, does anybody know what it is it's organized by? Atomic number, and atomic number is the number of protons. Okay, let's think about this for a second. When was When was Mendeleev doing his work? No. 1829. Close, but a little bit later. That's the first one. A little bit later. 1845. Very close. 69. Okay. I said 70. All right. So very close. Okay. So when was the pro when was the proton discovered? Who? No. no, later. 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 About 1900. 1920? No, not that, not that late. Around, ni around 1900, between 1900 and 1910. Okay, so this w he didn't know there was protons. So he couldn't organize them by atomic number because there was no such thing. So what was really interesting with Mendeleev is there was one huge glaring mistake. Iodine and tellurium weren't in the right group when he did atomic mass. Now this is always a test question. Okay, this is always a test question. Once again, this is always a test question. So I guess some people with their heads down right now are definitely going to get it wrong. Yes, this is always a test question. Okay, so what did he do? He said that iodine should with, be with bromine. So he moved it over there and said, oh, whoever did the mass calculation was wrong. Actually, the mass was correct. What he didn't know was atomic number. Once we put atomic number, they fell into the right place. But he actually, his table was very, very close to our modern table. Even with that, is, that's wrong because the atomic masses kind of go with the atomic numbers with very few exceptions. All right? So it still kind of worked out. And he said, well, two of them look like they go in the wrong place, but that must be because they made, it, they made a mistake in calculating their mass. So actually, Mendeleev was pretty close to the modern one. Okay, and this is the story I just told you right here. So iodine was moved. He put it in the right place, but not for the right reason. Okay, and as I said right here, okay, the problem wasn't with the atomic masses, but with using atomic mass to organize the periodic table. Okay? So that is a critical question always asked. What was wrong with Mendeleev's periodic table? Who can tell me what was wrong with per Mendeleev's periodic table? George. Instead of? And why couldn't he use atomic number? Because there was no discovery of? Good. All right. See? Okay. Mendeleev developed his table before scientists knew about the structure of atoms. Okay. He didn't know about protons. There's the modern periodic table. But wait a second. Something's wrong. Nothing's missing. Okay. So. As Alberto said, this section here isn't usually here. It's underneath. We've joined the two sections together and put those below the periodic table. Now, my personal opinion, and I think this is pretty true, is that the reason we did that was, you see how much space that takes up? Yeah. So when you're putting your periodic table and you want nice big boxes so you can fit stuff in there, they came up with the idea that this looks much better. This looks much better. 
All right. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful. It's a it's a beautiful piece of work. Okay. It's so beautiful. It's the best. All right. So why we have it? This is the actual way the periodic table goes because if you look at the numbers, fifty three. What's that? I can't read it. 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, those actually go there. So when we have this periodic table, these actually should be up here. But then we wouldn't have a nice big periodic table on an eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper. Okay, also, the properties of these two rows are similar to one another, okay? So another reason why we separate them out, okay. So, just so you know, this is the proper periodic table because everything's in order of atomic number. Okay, if you look at it, what's happening here? Okay, let's think about what we learned in the last unit. What? I heard that. Okay, if we look at these right here, we have S electrons filling. Over here, we have p electrons. Over here, we have d electrons. And over here, we have f electrons. We're going to see this later on a little bit more. I'm going to go into that a little bit more later on. All right? So, for instance, let's pick carbon. Okay, carbon is 1s, 2 Okay, so that's, that's going to bring us to helium. And then it's past these two, that's 2s2. And then, oh wait a second, I'm sorry, I went too far, oh no, I'm, I'm okay. And then we went 2p, 1, 2. Okay, see, it should add up to 6, 2, 4, 6. All right, watch what I did. It's in the second row, so we know these two are filled, 1s2. Okay, then this is the S's, 2S2, and now we're in the P's, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 P's, but we only went to the second P, so 2P2. And so, if we, our element is here, the last electron to fill is going to be in the P group. Let's, let's go down to, oh, let's go down to germanium. No, let's go down this one. Nickel. Okay, so we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Oh, watch. 4s2. Now the off file makes sense because we're going right here. Okay? But then we go back to 3d. So... Even though these here are in the fourth row, the Ds are always one number less. So our nickel is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, I'm sorry, it's up there. All right, so it's going to be 8. And some of you were asking me about when you're filling these out. The actual, this is our fill order, but if we were going to rewrite this, we would write it, rewrite it like this. So when they ask us for electron configuration, they're, I'm sorry, that's not 10, that's only 8. Ah. I press my butt. All right, so basically that's what we would do. Okay, we should have our phones put away. All right, so... In this slide, we're just saying we're starting out with hydrogen and then increasing by one for each element. Okay, this is important right here. Okay, each period 
corresponds to a principal energy level. So our principal energy level was n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, etc. So these numbers tell us what our principal energy level is, which corresponds to the first number in our electron configuration. So for the first three rows, you have S, S's and P's. In the fourth row, you have S, P, and D from the previous energy level. Okay, one more time. This is what I just showed you. All right, nickel again. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, and then 3d8, which I said, that's your filling order. But your electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d8, and 4s2. Okay, if you give it to me on a test that I'm grading, I'll accept either one of these. However, if you try to put that in Pearson for one of the ones you have to fill out, this is the actual electron configuration order. Okay, let me explain a little bit about this. Because this used to bother me, and that's why I said I'm not going to take it off for you, because I want you to know the off bow. Okay? What this gets you ready to do is when it's time to make an ion and we want to remove an electron, it's going to get removed from the highest energy level. And so the 4 is where it's going to be taken away from. So if it's at the end, we know that's the electrons that are going to go away. Now this makes a lot of sense because anything that has D electrons usually end up, end, uh, ends up giving away two or one electron. So it's the S electrons that are going away, not the Ds. It's harder to take those Ds away because they're at a lower energy level. Okay? That's an important fact. All right? No, because we don't have enough. It's nickel. Nickel doesn't have 10 of them. Re okay. D has 10 altogether, but it's nickel. So this is our fill order. So when we rewrite it into electron configuration order, this looks like it didn't get filled up. And it didn't because it's over here when we're filling. Okay? Make sense? All right. So as you can see, there's seven rows. Ah, there's seven rows. We call these rows periods, okay? Okay, notice towards the bottom of the table, there's more elements in each row. That's because we're adding more types of orbitals. We're adding Ds, then we're adding Fs. Okay. Yes, and if we go down to the Fs, here's our Fs, right? That's in the sixth row. What do you think our period number for the Fs in the sixth row is going to be? What do you think it's going to be? Anybody want to make a guess? Um, ben, what do you think? For the, the ones I've circled. Oh. What do you think the number is going to be next to it? Is it going to be six? Yes. How many people think it's going to be six? I think it's seven. All right. How many people think it's seven? How many think it's five? Four. <laughs> Three, two, one. It's four. Okay, remember how I said the first? Remember how I said this one was 3D? Okay, so the Ds are one less than the period. So this would be 4D down here. The Fs are two less. So what would the Fs in group seven be? Five F. Okay. Good job. All right.
All right, as you go across a period, the properties of each successive element will be different from the element next to it. Yes, George? Oh, that was a dab. That was a very poor dab. Oh. Uh, you're getting yourself in worse trouble now. Yes, that's right. Sam, put your phone away. All right. Once again, the properties of the elements within a period change as you move from left to right. Or right to left, for that matter. Okay, so, but after a certain period of time, the same properties appear. So that's when we, boom, boom, get to the new row. Okay? So as you move across, this idea of properties repeating is called the periodic law. Again, another fact that's always on the test. Periodic law. When elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number, there is a periodic repetition of their physical and chemical properties. This is the most important part of the periodic table. It shows us that there are elements that have similar properties and that we, it is organized according to atomic number. Those are the two most important things you need to know about the periodic table. Who? Uh, Who got kicked out? Uh, How'd you get? Yeah, how did you get it off? Did you close your computer? Well, look on with somebody else now, because it, 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 when you do that, it, everybody's. All right. You're gonna. I'm gonna come back to that at the very end. I'm gonna have have time that you can do that. Okay. I, I define that at the end also. What the? <laughs> what? What? Real. <laughs> All right. Now comes the important part about where are things that have similar properties, okay? Things that have similar properties are going to show up in the same column. So that means they're going to go up and down in the same column. Okay? So things. We call them family sometimes, or groups. The noble gases is a family or a group, yes. Okay. So sometimes they get special names, which we're going to talk about in one of the next videos. Okay. Today we're only going to give you an, a rough idea. Are elements with similar properties found in rows or columns of the modern periodic table? I want everyone to answer this correctly. What? 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 Look at the question. The question said, are elements with similar properties found in rows or columns of the modern period? Groups. No. Groups there is correct. No, it's columns. Yes, both the answers are correct. I a group. Thank you. Column. Yes, column. vertical columns. <coughs> All right. The next thing we're going to talk about is the elements in the periodic table are divided into three groups. Okay. Most elements are metals. The, the next broad class is nonmetals, and then the th smallest class is metalloids. Okay. So, without going any further, what do you think metalloids' properties are like? They're stable. Metal. Metal. No, they're not metal. They're metal. in between. Yes. They're not but quite they're like metals. Between metals, but they're not metals. Anymore. Okay. Like they be good for connectivity. And maybe. Capacity. Maybe. Okay. They're they're stable. Some of them are. They're pretty stable. Some of them are. Some of them are. Some of them are. Okay. But they have intermediate properties between metals and nonmetals. Okay. So here I have a color coded periodic table. All the yellow elements are metals. Okay? All the uh, green blue are nonmetals. And the green are gray. Oh, let me let me talk about the green first. Okay. The green are your metalloids. And if you had a question about um, the if you had a question about this one. 
Okay, notice these all have you something. The, these are the unnamed new elements. Okay, so 117, there is a lab that says they've discovered it. But it hasn't been replicated yet. And so they know it should be there, but they need some more investigation. So there's 118 elements now? Right now there's 118, and they've named up to 112. That may not be right. Here, where are these spots? Are these spots blank? Yeah. Well, you can use the U. You. Oh. No. If, if these are not supposedly there. No. I mean, if we have, if they're yellow, we've said they do exist, so this, but we haven't named them. So this row is like looking like empty. Actually, anything greater than ninety-two is human-made, yeah. so yeah. they have very short half-lives. Yes. All right. Oh, I see what you have in front. Okay, so metals are on the left side. Oh, I'm going to get to that in one second. Give me a break. All right, so left, metals. Notice what happens here. Look at way over here. What happens? These are metals, but they're underneath the non-metals. So what can we say as we go down a group? Elements get more what as you go down a group? They get more unstable. <laughs> Reactive. They get more, more. Actually, you're right on both cases, but that's not. I'm looking at the colors. Look over here. As you go down these groups, the elements become more what? Bigger. More like, bigger. yes, they become more metallic. Okay. That's what I said. What did you say? All right. All right. Val had a question about this. This is hydrogen. Yeah. Yeah. But no, because you said all the ones on the left. I know. Notice how hydrogen is all by itself. Hydrogen can either be put there or right where I'm doing that square. Why did they put it there? Okay, because it's the first element, and it looks nicer there. But the thing is, it could be either place. It doesn't really behave like any of the other elements. It's unique. That's why it's by itself up there. But it's definitely not a metal. So if it's not a metal, it has to be a non-metal. Because non means not. Okay, so that's why it's there. It's... Th Well, it's it's it has atomic number of one, so no, no, no. You see, you see, you see these lines, Val. You see these lines, Val. What number is this, Val? Look, what number is this that I'm pointing to? Fifty-six. What number is this? Fifty-seven. So that means I'm supposed to put that right there, and I'm supposed to put. The, remember, I was showing. Remember I showed you the big periodic table? That's where it comes from. All right. So as we saw in the last picture, that's how most periodic tables are put out. All right, guys, I'm doing this for you today, and I see a lot of people being distracted, doing other things. That tells me you don't want me to do this anymore. Okay. But other people ask for it, so you should be respectful for them asking for it today. All right? Okay. All right. This is the answer I just went over. Okay? That's why those two rows are put underneath the periodic table. Notice they say they make the table more compact. I think that's the ba ba biggest reason. All right, now this is important. Okay, if we go back to the periodic table, we'll see three groups of numbers and letters on every column. For instance, we see an Arabic 1, a Roman numeral 1, A, and a Arabic numeral 1A. 
Arabic is your normal numbers, and Roman are like the I's and V's. You see what is 1A, 1A. So, today, we use, we use um, columns 1 through 18 for group numbers. Okay, that was changed when I was in, I think after I got out of college. So, it took me a long time not to say group 1A, group 2A. In America, in the United States, we use the red, red numbers. In Europe, they use the blue numbers. Okay, so you'll notice that group 7A is 7B in Europe, so they did away with it because there was too much confusion and just went through 1 through 18. So, scientists in the United States tend to use red, scientists in Europe use the blue, but no. I will, I tend now to use 1 through 18, okay? But there is a nice reason for using the Roman numerals, and I'll talk about that when we get there. Oh, yeah. So in 1985, I was working by that point in time. So I was used to using the 1A, 2A, and all those sort of things, okay? After teaching for as long as I have, I finally adopted 1 through 18. I still like the 1As. Okay, so sometimes you might hear me say that. When I refer to group 13, I might say group 3, because that's how I learned it, okay? All right, as a review, the three classes of elements are metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Another very good test question. Okay, as you go across the period, elements become less metallic and more nonmetallic. This is different than the other thing I said. I said as you go down a column or group, they get more metallic. Going across a period, they get less metallic. So 80% of our elements are metals. So now I'm going to talk about the properties of metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Okay, metals are good conductors of heat and electric current. Very important. Always a test question. All right, so good conductors. Conduction is both electricity and heat. Okay, copper is used in wire because it's a good conductor of electricity. But it's not as good as silver. Why don't you think we have lots of silver wire? Let's go. All right, good answer. It's too expensive. But you know what? Copper's getting expensive now, too. What have some people done, especially in Haiti? This has happened in Haiti quite a bit. They went and took air conditioning copper out of people's houses when they weren't home to melt. Okay, and that's even happening in Miami now too. But <laughs> yep. that's why they stole the air conditioner, not to use the air conditioner. All right, copper is used in electric cables. Look at this. The copper has to be almost 100% pure, or it's not going to work. Okay, the next characteristic of metal is if you clean a metal, it will sh be shiny and bright. That's called luster or sheen. It has to do with the ability to reflect light. Okay, all metals are solid except, Ben? Yeah. Okay, who, ductile. Ductile is another characteristic of metal. Ductile means you can form a wire. You can pull the metal out and form a wire. Okay, so if... What? Because making a wire, you can't do that with oxygen. You can't do it with carbon. All right, so it's a very important thing because you saw those coil of copper wires. It's very important to make wire, okay? It's something that we need. Okay, most... Most metals are malleable. I love the word malleable. Because malleable means to change its shape, kind of. Move it around. How many people have ever seen like a steeple or something, a dome or something that has got gold on it, like golden color? Okay, that's gold leaf. Isn't that pyrite? Oh, 
No, it's not pyrite. It's gold. Okay, it's, it's real gold. But it's not. The dome is not solid gold. Okay, you know. Let me and talk about the gold right now. Okay, the gold has been hammered and hammered and hammered, and you know how aluminum foil is like a foil. It's been hammered even thinner than that. So you know if you have a leaf on your hand, it's nice and small and thin. It's even thinner than a leaf in your hand. It's like you took the leaf and made it even thinner. So then they take these little pieces of gold leaf, put it on the dome, and spread it out until they put it all over the place. So then it's got gold leaf, and it's very, it doesn't react with anything. They have to replace it after the rain hits it for years and years, but it will last a long time. So the amount of gold on a big dome may be only a little bit, but it makes it nice and shiny. Okay, so that's because gold is malleable. Look at the tin pie, um, the um, pie tins. They're made out of aluminum. We call them tins because they used to be made out of tin. All right, so we have the pie tins. That it, aluminum can be made into foils. So that's another reason why they're ma malleable. You can make big pieces of metal and make them into a foil. Can you guys be quiet? Okay. Now we're going to go to the not... That's not garbage, guys. Okay. Non-metals are not malleable for the most part, okay? Most of them are gases at room temperature. If we go back over here, look over here. Guys, let's focus. Okay, if we look, everything here. Those are all gases at room temperature. Even iodine, iodine is technically a solid, but it turns into gas very easily. Okay, so most of them are gases. Okay, um, a few are solid, like sulfur and phosphorus, and bromine is a liquid at room temperature. Okay, we can't say so much about the general properties of nonmetals because they can be different. Carbon could be a diamond, which is super hard, okay? But carbon could also be graphite, which might be in a writing instrument that you're using right now. And that's very soft, or you wouldn't be able to see anything on your paper when you apply some pressure. Or most of them are brittle to a certain degree, which means that they kind of break apart very easily, like phosphorus. Okay. In general, they tend to have properties different than metals. They are very, very poor conductors. Okay. Now, the only one that is a good conductor is graphite. Graphite can be used as an electrode. Okay? And if, if you hit a nonmetal with a hammer, it will break apart. Oh. So if you hit a gas. Oh, yeah, that's so true. <laughs> no, it's already broken apart. We're talking about solid ones. Okay? Oh. Wait, what if they're not Humans? We're made up of a lot of different things. Metal. All right, now we're moving to metalloids. Okay, they're in between. We call this a staircase because it looks like a staircase. Okay, anything on the right side of the staircase for the beginning and anything below here, polonium is not a nonmetal. It's actually a radioactive metal. Okay, but those elements are not... Metalloids. Okay, a metalloid generally has properties that are similar to those of metals and nonmetals. They kind of have a multiple personality. Okay, and it depends on the conditions that they find themselves in. Now, I'm only going to talk about two of them, silicon, or one of them. Silicon is used in wafers in your computer, or you wouldn't be having that laptop in front of you and seeing what you're seeing right now. Okay, they make computer chips. Okay, they have to be very, very pure, and they have some other elements mixed in with that so that electrons can flow easily, so they become a good conductor. However, you can also make glass out of silicon. So that's not a good conductor. Glass is usually an insulator. So it has both properties, okay? What else has silicon in it that you might come, up, come across maybe every day? 
Okay, if it's a hot, hot day in the summer, where might you go? And what's at the beach? Sand. sand. And what's in sand? Silicon dioxide. Really? Yeah. Oh my god. Oh George. my god. George is still silicone. Right. Silicon, That's silicon not silicone. Silicone is something yeah. totally different. That's what I was thinking. All right. Yeah, I was thinking that too. You're full of silicon. How did you know? All right. How can you classify elements using the periodic table? What things can you find out by looking at the periodic table? Okay, atomic number, atomic mass, symbol, period groups, electron configuration, you could probably figure that out. What? Parties. Which ones are non-metals? Which ones are non-metals? Which ones are? And? Metal alloys. Metal alloys. Metal alloys and the big one, the big one. And non metal. Uh, me okay. Okay, which has a more variety of properties? Metals or non metals? Non metals. Non metals. Okay. The metals of pro metal properties are constant. But different nonmetals have different properties. All right, summarize. Early chemists used the properties of elements to sort them into groups. Mendeleev arranged the elements in his periodic table in order of increasing atomic mass. In the modern periodic table, elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number. There are three classes of elements metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Okay, I'm going to leave this up for a second if you didn't get these two definitions. So please copy those down. And I'll wait. Periodic law and metal. Please copy those down or take a screenshot. Thank you for telling me that. Remember, this is going online. All right, I think, yes. Yes. All right, non-metal and metalloid. I'll go back, I'll go back. Stop bullying Priel, just write down the terms because when you read the chapter, you can get it right from the chapter too. Okay? So I'm going to go to the next one. Non metal and metalloid. So these are vocabulary that you should have. And this section's big idea was periodic tables may contain each element's name, symbol, atomic number, and atomic mass. And you told me that. Very good. Okay, that's it, folks, for today. Wait, <laughs> <laughs>